This is a, a lecture for my seventh hour class on the twenty uh, second of March, and you will uh, have an exam on Friday. Okay. So uh, anyway. And, and remember, I just on my last little announcements, whoever may not be here, um, remember if you miss an exam, make it up. Uh, this may not apply to any of you here today, but if you miss the last exam we took before spring break, today is the last day to make it up. I've already had people come in and make it up, so you need, before you leave school today, you need to make sure you do that. So anyway. Uh, well, Teddy Roosevelt, as I started to say a moment ago, was born to a life of privilege. Yeah, he never really had to worry about money. He's not as rich as Andrew Carnegie, but the Roosevelts were well off. And he got, a, you know, started out as this puny little sickly kid, and uh, through hard work and the uh, encouragement of his father, he managed to, uh, you know, build himself up, uh, become reasonably healthy, although Teddy Roosevelt, despite all the things that he does in life, all the daring risks and that sort of thing that he does in life, Teddy Roosevelt uh, never was in good health in his life. And he dies pretty young. He dies when he's only 59 years old of a heart failure. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, he went to college. He went to a great university. He was the uh, on the boxing team at Harvard. He met uh, a girl, the most beautiful girl on the campus. He married her. And then on February 14, 1884, uh, his mother and his wife died. His wife died giving childbirth to his oldest daughter, a young girl named uh, Alice, okay? And um, uh, from that point on, you know, he tried for, for a few years. Are you awake? Move your hand from in front of your face. That, that's the oldest. I, I saw people doing that in 1981. Uh, that's how long I've been watching sophomores. So that don't work in here. So stay awake. Uh, anyway, uh, the rules never change here. Anyway, uh, Roosevelt went west to escape this sorrow. I mean, his whole world came crashing down on him. And uh, he went west and he built a ranch and he had the time of his life. In fact, he often said that uh, the romance of his life began out in the Badlands of South Dakota. What was the name of his ranch? Did we write that down? Yeah. Uh, Elkhorn. Yeah. You still go see the. So it burned down later, but you can still go see the scorched foundations of it, okay? Uh, and so he stayed out there in the West for a number of years, but then he came back, get this down, he came back to New York City in 1895. <clears throat> and in 1897, you don't have to have all this down, but, uh, you know, it might help you. In 1897, he comes back in 1895, he's still a young man. 1897, you know this already, because you remember the Spanish-American War begins in 1898. You might make yourself a little timeline here, but he was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, okay? Assistant Secretary of the Navy, <clears throat> 1897. And the war breaks out, and you know, what, what role did he play early in the Spanish-American War? What did he do? Before he joined the Rough Riders and stormed up San Juan Hill. Wasn't he a general? Huh? Well, he came in as a colonel, but even before that, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, what did he do? He ordered the Navy to attack the Philippines. He initiated hostilities, as they would call it, and he started the war. Uh, and then, of course, in the Spanish American War, you have San Juan Hill, and he comes home, got this down in 1899 as one of the biggest heroes in the world. He's not just a hero, he's a celebrity. T.R.'s a celebrity, okay? And get this, they just keep right on writing. we got a lot to do today. Uh, is it comfortable in here to you? That's a pretty comfortable. It's hot to me. Anyway, not too hot for you? Not too, okay. Anyway, I'm going to wear a different coat tomorrow. I'm getting rid of this winter coat. But anyway, I guess that's part of the problem. Anyway. He comes back and he's elected governor of New York. And I want you to get this down about Roosevelt. Now, listen to me carefully. He was a progressive liberal. Roosevelt was a progressive Have we done that? No. He, well, anyway, he's a, anyway, he's a progressive liberal. In other words, and he stood for change. He wanted to change things in New York. He's the governor of New York. Just think about this, this young guy. 1898, not many people have heard of him. And by 1899, he's 
the most populous, popular man. I've got to answer this. Hello? Hello? From where? Oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Good to talk to you. Anyway, he goes from being essentially unknown. Well, I'm not going to waste time. You know, on my, when I died, for the, 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 the two minutes that I would, would uh, waste talking to that idiot, I would give everything I had to have two minutes more. So I'm not going to waste my time. I'll let him waste his time. Anyway, well, they call when you see when you get old. That's another, that's another downturn of being old. They call you. They want to say stuff all the time. Once you get on Medicare, everybody in the world will call me, uh, and I'm on Medicare anyway. Well, not that. Uh, Roosevelt goes from being unknown uh, to the governor of New York in about a year. That's that's a pretty rapid. That's a pretty rapid rise to power. Okay. <clears throat> And he's a progressive liberal. Well, New York, I want you to get this man down. New York in those days was controlled by a boss. Can you think of any? Can I show you these pictures of TR? Well, there he is out in the West as a cowboy. You can see he's not very tall. Look, you know, he barely makes it to the saddle on the horse's back. There's a cowboy picture of TR with his pistol. There's another one. That wasn't even made in the West. He had that made in New York City. <clears throat> he had that made in New York City in a studio. All those trees and all that, so it's all painted. It's not real. <clears throat> well, can you name me a boss of New York that we've talked about? A boss of New York boss City? Tweed. Uh, boss Tweed. Yeah. Remember him? Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed, though, only controlled New York City. This guy, get him down. Tom Platt. Write him down. Tom Platt was the boss Thomas Platt was the boss of the whole state of New York. Thomas Platt. And if he supported you, if you were running for president, he could guarantee you that you would win New York. And by the way, what's important about winning New York in presidential politics today and then? Why did everybody want to win New York? Well, this is the reason this guy's got so much power. What? Yes, it's in, in, in 1900, in 1900, New York was the most populous state. What is the most populous state today? California. How many electoral votes does California have? 55 or 56. How many does Oklahoma have? Seven. Yeah, you won't see a lot of candidates out here campaigning for president. In a presidential election, they live in California. They want those electoral votes. Well, the same was true, and then the same is true about New York today. But in those days, uh, it was uh, uh, California. It was the biggest state that had the most electoral votes, okay? So, <clears throat> Tom Platt was the boss of New York. Do you think Tom Platt was a conservative or a liberal? Was he a reformer or a conservative? conservative. Why was he a conservative? You're right. Why was he a conservative? Because he didn't want things. That's exactly right. Why does he want things to change? He's living his best life. Huh? He's living his best life. What? He's living his best life. Yeah, he's in charge. You know, if you're in charge, you don't want things to change. Everything's great. Teddy Roosevelt wanted things to change. And of course, Teddy Roosevelt and Tom, get this down. Teddy Roosevelt and Tom Platt, they're just always butting heads. They're arguing all the time. And Tom Platt wants to get Roosevelt out of New York. He wants him out. And he's looking for a way to get Teddy Roosevelt out. Then comes the election, get this down, of 1900. And now I want to start talking to you about the election of 1900. <clears throat> First thing I want you to write about the election of 1900 is that <clears throat> the, the Republicans are going to win that election. Okay, the Republicans are going to win that election. There is no way that the Democrats have a chance. And here's why. I want you to know why that's true. Okay? I want you to know why that's true. 
Let's see here. I just want to make sure I'm not leaving out something. Hmm. Well, anyway, here's why. I get this down. Number one, well, you tell me why. Why, why are the Republicans going to win this election just hands down? By the way, who are the Republicans going to nominate for president? Who? McKinley. McKinley. Write that down. William McKinley. You remember McKinley had been elected back in 1896. What was going on in this country in 1896 that caused the American people to elect McKinley, who was a Republican? Uh, there was a depression. Write that down. There was a depression. And, by the way, by 1900, when McKinley is running for re-election as a Republican, get that straight in your head, the Depression was over. So he had ended the Depression. People were working again. Do you remember what, what was McKinley's campaign slogan back in 1896? Do you remember that when he ran? McKinley and the full dinner pail. Elect me and you'll need your lunch bucket again because you're going to have a job. Well, guess what? He had done that. So the American people are going to... But what was the biggest thing that happened in this country between 1896 and 1900? And, and, and McKinley won it. Did we do this yesterday? Yeah. Have we done this yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, anyway, it's a review. Have we nominated Teddy Roosevelt for vice president yet? Yeah. Well, anyway, on we go. This will be a little bit of a review. Anyway, McKinley was a war president. He had won the war, and there's nothing we like better than that. So McKinley is sailing to victory, but there's only one problem that he has. And what was that? He a BP. Yeah, he didn't have a BP because his vice president had died. Okay. Did we talk about balancing the ticket? Yeah. yeah. Very good. You didn't hear my joke in the beginning of the hour. I was, Do what? I made a joke about it. I was like, I think we need to balance the ticket. So I said it would be an hour. Oh, yeah, I remember that joke. <laughs> hey, you know what? We reach over and fan her. I think she's having a seat. There you go. Thank you very much. Yeah, she saved your life. But anyway, any old laughing if it does that to you. Anyway. So TR, TR becomes the vice president. Okay, we, we, we talked about that. Right. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure we got everything. So the testimony will say, well, we didn't cover that. Well, I do this five times a day, and there are five different places. I'm lost anyway. So anyway, <laughs> TR became the vice president. And, and he and McKinley, get to, let's just move on here. He and McKinley won. Who was the Democrat? Who did the Democrats nominate in 1900? Who's the Democrats nominate? Who's the Democrat you know from the 1890s and early 1900s? Who? Uh, Ryan. Who'd you say? Ryan's. Write that down. They nominated Gary. William Jennings Bryan for the second time. They nominated him in 1896 and they nominated him in 1900. He lost both times. And so they're going to nominate him again in 1908. He's going to lose in 1908. By the way, what was William Jennings Bryan's big issue? That he just kept hitting it again and again and again. What was his big issue? Uh, gold silver. Yeah, silver. Yeah. And guess what? He was still screaming about silver when the rest of the American people had forgotten about silver. It was no longer that much of an issue, okay? But he's going to ride uh, the silver issue to his political grave. So, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and William McKinley became the President of the United States. In March, get this down, in March of 1901. in March of 1901. And McKinley, now let's think about this, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. Six months, seven months into McKinley, get this down, six or seven months into McKinley's administration. He, just been, he and Roosevelt just been sworn in. Six months, McKinley was invited to open up 
a Pan American exhibition. And you don't have to write that down, but it was just, he was, he was, I'll just put this one. He was invited to make a speech in Buffalo, New York. And he went up to Buffalo, New York to make a speech. Presidents do that all the time. So the president was leaving Washington and he was going to Buffalo, New York. Teddy Roosevelt, vice president, he doesn't have much to do. And so he says, I'm going to go out into the mountains. He's going to go out to the western part of New York. Teddy Roosevelt, oh, okay. who's vice president. The president's leaving town. So Roosevelt said, I'm going to go out to the Adirondack Mountains in western New York, one of the most beautiful places in America. He said, I'm going to fish and climb mountains. Okay. And that's what he goes out there to do. He, uh, <laughs> Takes a train up to uh, uh, Buff uh, to uh, Albany, New York, and then he gets a buckboard with two mules and puts some supplies in it. This is the vice president of the United States. He has absolutely no secret service, and they go out west, head west. And finally, he gets so deep in the woods that the buckboard can't make it. There's no longer a trail, so he takes uh, he takes a um, takes the mules off uh, the wagon. He loads his supplies on one of the mules, and then he hops on the other, and he keeps going, and he gets way out in the middle of upstate New York, out of the woods so far that the Secret Service couldn't even, Secret Service can't even find him. And there he builds a big fire, and he's having the time of his life. He he's really uh, doesn't know what's going on in the rest of the world. The president, meanwhile, goes up to Buffalo, New York, to make his speech. And McKinley makes his speech, and is well received. And when he's through making the speech, some of the sponsors uh, Say to him, would you like to go? We've got a big tent set up. Uh, a lot of people would like to come in and shake your hand. And McKinley was really a friendly guy. He, you know, everybody liked him. They might have disagreed with him some on politics, but everybody liked him. And uh, he was kind of like the national grandfather. And so people lined up outside that tent, and McKinley's standing there, and he's shaking hands with people. And a little girl comes up, a little cute little girl comes up with a little white dress. And that day, McKinley was wearing a red carnation. Uh, and uh, this little girl comes up and McKinley bends down uh, to shake her hand. And he thought, but well, it'd be something. Wouldn't this little girl treasure this for the rest of her life if she, uh, uh, if I gave her this carnation? And so just he unpins the carnation from his coat and he bends down and he pins it to her dress. Do you know what a pen knife is? Have you ever heard that word, pen knife? It's a little knife about that long. You can take it, and I don't know clean out your fingernails, just a little blade about that long, not very ferocious looking. Well, McKinley bends over, and while he's pinning that carnation of that little girl's dress, that little girl, she was about seven or eight years old, she had uh, a little pen knife in her pocket, and she pulled that out and opened it, and she stabbed McKinley in the neck and cut his jugular, and he bled out right there. And the president was dead. And who's president? Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Man, that's great. That didn't happen. Okay. Uh, that didn't happen. No, that's not what happened. Like, he did. He did. Yeah, scratch that. He did pin the carnation on the little girl's dress. But standing, not, and you don't have to write this guy's name down, but standing behind the little girl in the line. Let's see if I'm, yeah, there we go. Uh, there he is right there. There was an anarchist. You know, the anarchists didn't want any form of government. They were against all governments. And McKinley stood for the United States government. An anarchist named Leon Zalgaz, whoops, Zalgaz, was in line behind the little girl, and he had a bandage on his hand. Okay, a pistol like this marker, and he had a bandage. And when McKinley reached out his hand to shake hands with Zalgaz, Zalgaz held out his left hand, and McKinley started to reach for his left hand, and as McKinley's reaching for his left hand, Zalgaz raises the pistol, and he shot McKinley twice. And McKinley fell back into those shrubs behind him. That wasn't a good idea in the first huh? place. That wasn't a good idea in the first place to just meet people like that when he knows people could just like... Well, yeah, but it was a different time, and he has, you know, he has secret servicemen with him, you know, he uh, was sort of a trusted soul. And, and yeah, but as it turns out, it wasn't a good time. But McKinley falls back, and the Secret Service, they dogpile this guy, and they drag him off, and McKinley said to them, don't shoot him, don't hurt him. No, no, don't shoot him. Don't hurt him. Uh, and then they take, and McKinley isn't, you know, he doesn't appear to be mortally wounded, but they 
take him down to a uh, they take him down to a uh, tent just down the street from there. And you know who was the most famous inventor in American history? He invented over a thousand things. Thomas. Huh? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was just down the street uh, demonstrating his latest invention. It was called a bullet detector. And it had a wand on it, and it had a round head about that big, and it was uh, powered by electricity. And if you were shot and they couldn't find the bullet, they would lay you out, and they would just run that up and down your stomach or your back or wherever the bullet would go. He had been shot right there twice, right? He had them, okay? Uh, well, it didn't work, and uh, they couldn't find the bullets, and so they opened him up, and they looked, and uh, the bullets were pressed right behind his stomach and his intestines. They said it would be too dangerous. If you nick his intestines, he'll bleed to death. And so they just cleaned out the wound. They said he can live, with, you know, a lot of people live with a bullet in them. He said he can live with that bullet in him. And they cleaned out the wound, uh, and they sewed him back up, and they bandaged it, and they said the president's okay. Meanwhile, the president had been shot. It made the national news. A Secret Service man was set up to where Teddy Roosevelt was to tell him the president had been shot. And Roosevelt said, oh my gosh, should I come back? And they said, no, don't worry about it. The president's going to be just fine. A week later, get this down, the president died. And Roosevelt was climbing. When he gets word, the Secret Service man had to crawl halfway up a mountain. I've got the name of the mountain, but Roosevelt, when he gets the word that he's now the president of the United States, he was crawling up. He was crawling up a 5,000 foot tall mountain. And the Secret Service has to go up and tell him. And he comes down and he comes back to the White House. By the way, what did McKinley die of? The wound got infected. He would have lived today. Uh, again, you and I, we don't know how lucky we are to live in the age of antibiotics. They would have just pumped him full of antibiotics and he'd have been fine. Antibiotics didn't exist in those days. And so his intestines became infected with, you know what gangrene is? You know what that is? What is gangrene? What is gangrene? Literally, if you got gangrene on your hand, your hand would rot off right down to your skeletal structure. It's all, it's like leprosy, okay? Uh, and he got infected and he died of gangrene of the intestines. His intestines rotted inside his body. Can you imagine how painful that must have been? So he died and now Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States. Now you think you can tell me that story on an essay, how he became president of the United States? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, I'm glad. I look forward to reading it. We're probably going to do that next week. And Monday I'll talk about the essay. Probably. Big P for probably. What does next week look like so far as activities? Are you going to be out on a bunch of trips? And, uh, There's a virtual day on Monday. What? There's a virtual day Monday. And this gone. next Monday is a virtual yeah. day? Yeah. You're and kidding me. Ben's gone. Ben's gone Wednesday. Wednesday. Well, anyway. Baseball might be gone Wednesday next week. How's golf? Are you going to, are you on the golf thing? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You yeah, haven't seen your schedule yet. Well, listen, listen, I'm glad that you brought that up. I have no clue. That, but when we have a virtual day, I'm going to have, if they let me, you check every virtual day because I'm going to have class. I may just talk to you about 30 minutes instead of 40 or 45, but I'm going to have class and you're responsible for that, okay? So when we have that virtual day, you check that YouTube. We just don't have enough time in the school year. We're behind anyway because I had to be absent for a few weeks. So I'm trying to make up for that as best I can. But you, when, when, just because we're on a virtual day, that isn't a day off, okay? That isn't a day off. So now, Teddy Roosevelt's president of the United States. Who was, Mark, who was um, William McKinley's best friend? Got him elected president, ran his campaign. Oh, uh, the, his last name is Hannah, right? Mark Hannah, very good. Excellent. Man, oh. Way to go. Way to go. Awesome. Good catch. Uh, Mark Hannah, okay. And Mark, remember, I don't know if I told you this, but Mark Hannah, when they said we're going to choose Roosevelt as the vice president, Mark Hannah told them not to do it. Did I tell you that? Well, I'm telling you now. When they were talking about Roosevelt being the vice president, Mark Hannah said, don't do it. He said, and they said, why not? He's young, he's dynamic, he'll help the ticket. And Mark Hanna said, don't you know if you nominate him as vice president that you will put, be putting that, and this is what Hanna called him, that damned cowboy one heartbeat away from the president. You understand that Kamala Harris, and this is really serious, you understand that Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, what is he, 80 years old? You know, when you get to be 80, uh, 
you understand that Kamala Harris is just one heartbeat, one heartbeat away from being the president of the United States. A lot of times we don't pay attention, you know, who are they going to nominate for vice president? Oh, we don't know. We're interested in the presidential candidate, but you better be interested in the vice presidential candidate because one heartbeat away. And they all laughed at Mark Hanna. They said, McKinley's healthy. He's going to live for four years. He'll serve out his second term. And then Roosevelt will do what most vice presidents do. He'll go his own way and we'll never hear from him again. And then McKinley gets shot. And then TR becomes president. And Mark Hanna's reaction was this. Number one, he just lost his best friend. And with tears coursing down his cheeks, Mark Hanna slapped the side of his face and said, oh my God, now that damned cowboy is president of the United States. That's what he referred to Roosevelt as. Well, it was true. Uh, Roosevelt, there's a picture of Roosevelt. That's a great picture of him. And we'll get to that in just, we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, never has anyone, I think, enjoyed being president more than Teddy Roosevelt. You know, we elect presidents and they look relatively young. We elect presidents and they look relatively young. And then by the end of four years or eight years, they look like they're old men. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the presidency was good for him. Not only did he enjoy it, uh, he looked uh, he looked uh, even better at the end of his presidency than he did at the, uh, than he did before. Uh, get this down. He's the youngest. And by the way, get this down. He's get this down. He's probably the most popular president in our history. And this is going to sound like an oxymoron, but even his enemies liked him. Political enemies. They disagree with him, but they liked him. Uh, when you look at the 47 or 48 men, 47 men that have been president, 48 maybe, yeah, 48 men that have been president, so far all men, well, a woman's coming. But uh, if you look at the 47 or 48 men that have been presidents of the United States, probably it's either Eisenhower or TR, the most popular presidents. Maybe it's TR. He's also the youngest man ever to serve as president. Get that down. He's the youngest man to serve as president. How old was he? We elect these 80-year-olds presidents today. How old was T.R.? 32. No. Nope. How old has he got to be to be president? 36. 36. So how old was he? 36. 42. But by the way, now I didn't say he was the youngest ever elected because was he elected? To his no. first, no, he what, what's he doing the first four years? He's, he's just serving out McKinley's term, right? He's 42. Who's the youngest president ever elected? Was it Obama? Nope, oh, that's an educated guess. Obama was a young man. We used to elect young people presidents. John F. Kennedy, the guy right over there, JFK, he was 43 when he was elected. So he's the youngest elected, the youngest to ever serve is Teddy Roosevelt. I say he was popular by 1904. Get this down, by 1904, Roosevelt, you know, there were a million. Let me ask you this before I tell you that. Um, how many of you have ever had a teddy bear? One honest person in the back right here. How many of you still have it? And sitting up on your bed, and when you have a tough day in school, you go in and you hold Teddy and you say, Teddy, let me tell you. Come on, Elkins, you know you do. <laughs> well, for all you teddy bear, I had one when I was a little kid, all you teddy bear fans, you can thank Teddy Roosevelt. By the way, Roosevelt hated to be called Teddy. Anybody that knew him didn't call him that. But the crowds loved him, and 10,000 people would gather, and they, it was like a cult. They would yell, Teddy, Teddy. And like a good politician, he would stand back there with, with one arm behind him and used to look and wave like this, okay? Uh, probably couldn't see him, but Teddy, he learned to grin and bear it. But if you knew him and you called him Teddy, you were in trouble. By the way, after he becomes president, nobody ever calls him Teddy again, maybe except his wife. Uh, what is, what is your name? If you're ever elected president, you have a big name change. What is it? Mr. Prep forever. You go to your grave. You're Mr. President. 
Uh, but anyway, here's the story. Here's the Teddy Roosevelt story. This is where the uh, teddy bear. There we go. You have a teddy bear that looks like that. You do? Do you talk to it? Yeah, actually, yeah. Well, would you get out your phone and call the school nurse? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Well, here's where the teddy bear came from. This is completely unimportant, but I think it's a neat story. Roosevelt was a hunter. That's how we got that Nixon. He shot anything. By the way, worse than that, he was a trophy hunter. Now, I can sort of understand people saying, well, we shoot this to eat. I can sort of understand that. But someone that just a beautiful mountain goat in the Rockies lived his whole life out there. And somebody just shoots it to cut its head off and put it on the wall. I got a real problem with that. I wish that without a trophy hunting. Exactly. They're acting like the animal Teddy. fight back to the Yeah. Animal. Well whoa well, well occasionally one of these great oh, yeah. they, these great white hunters, they'll get on the wrong side of the animal and the animal will trample them. And then everybody wants to arm themselves and go up and shoot the bear. You know, I've got I've got a my favorite niece's husband. He's a big oh my god! He's a, you know he and his buddies they get the, they get they have trailers they hunt on mules they go up in the rock oh you know, it's a big yearly yearly thing you know and uh, I was there one day to see her I can't stand him but I was there one day <laughs> and I was just walking across the driveway there and they were all uh, loaded up and uh, and uh, one of them, he said about six or eight of them. Uh, I mean, it looked like they were going to invade Canada or something. And they said, Uncle, would you like to go with us? And I said, well, boys, all I can say is health to the bears. You know, they were going bear. I, I hope the bears get you. <laughs> I just wish they didn't, unfortunately. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you go up to where this bear lives, and the bear comes out to defend himself. It's kind of like if you woke up in your bed this morning at 2 o'clock and there was a grizzly bear coming in your bedroom, you'd probably defend yourself. Uh, and then everybody wants to load up their guns and they want to go kill these bears, you know. Well, I say if you go poke your nose in a cave when there's a bear and swat your face off, I think you're sort of asking for it. But anyway, that's another top. My view on hunting is another topic for another day. But anyway, Roosevelt was a big hunter. And I'll show you some things he shot. Uh, if it moved, he pretty well shot it. But anyway, back to the teddy bear. This all is related to the teddy bear. Uh, there was a fire in Mississippi right after he became president forest burned down. And you know, a lot of times when there are earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, the president will go down and he'll visit that place. So not only is the president of the United States the commander-in-chief, the president of the United States is the comforter-in-chief sometimes. So he was there and uh, he was walking around in this burned out forest in Mississippi. And you can see from this, this is a cartoon about this that uh, says drawing the line in Mississippi. Uh, this is a cartoon. Uh, about this incident I'm talking about, Roosevelt was just walking around, and one of his aides came up and uh, saw a, a dead bear, a, a female, a she bear, uh, that had been killed in the fire, and this little cub was sniffing around and didn't know its mother was dead. And this aide said, Oh boy, this is great. The boss likes to shoot animals. He said, We'll just tie, you see, he's got a rope around it. He said, We'll just tie this little cub to the stump, and we'll go tell the president he'll want to shoot it. And so they went and they told Roosevelt, oh, we found the bear. Oh, great, delighted. And Roosevelt goes out to see this bear. And when he gets there, it's a little cub tied to a tree. And Roosevelt just upbraids him. He just lets him have it. You know, you idiots. You know, do you think that's really sporting? Do you think a real sportsman will do that? Let's him have it. And he lets him untie the bear. And he actually reached down and he picked the bear up. Little cut and he held it like this. I used to have a picture of that. And you know, if you look at even that cartoon of Roosevelt, he sort of looks like a bear. Uh, when the building burned in 95, I lost that picture and I've never been able to find it again. But look at that picture, it looks like he's one of his kids, a little bear cub. And he let it go. Uh, but this made all the national newspapers, you know, drawing the line. Roosevelt was a big hunter, but he said, I'm not going to shoot a help us out. That's what he's drawing the line is. And never underestimate the ability of an American uh, entrepreneur to uh, to uh, make a buck. And the next year at Christmas, there were a million teddy bears, one million teddy bears on sale in American department stores. And the teddy bear has been an American staple ever since. 
Most of you. Yeah. Well, so when you scrunch up next to your teddy bear, what's your teddy bear's name? Teddy Roosevelt. You're not your teddy bear. No, no, it's not. I thought you were ahead of the curve. <laughs> what's its name? Sam. Well, when you scrunch up to Sam tonight, you can say, Sam, we owe Teddy Roosevelt a lot. Okay. <laughs> Study yes, for your test. Be ready.